Nick Danilov, aka Socrates here, and as always, I will be the man with the questions. Today, we are here at the University of Arizona campus, where the man with the answers will be Dr. Stuart Hamroff. Let's go. So Stuart, uh, let me begin our interview by perhaps asking you, how would you introduce yourself in one or two words? Would you say that you're a scientist? Would you say that you're a medical doctor? Or would you say that perhaps you're a philosopher interested <laughs> in the issue of consciousness? All three, I guess. My day job is an anesthesiologist. I earn my living by working in the surgical operating rooms here at the University of Arizona Medical Center, uh, taking care of patients, putting them to sleep, taking care of them during surgery, waking them up, uh, providing uh, post-operative care, and teaching residents and medical students how to do anesthesiology. I've been doing it uh, almost 40 years. My academic research during that time, I am a professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and Psychology and director of the Center for Consciousness Studies at the University of Arizona, has to do mostly with figuring out how the brain produces consciousness and how anesthesia works to erase consciousness. And that does get into philosophical issues, so I'm sort of an amateur philosopher. I also co-organize the uh, Toward a Science of Consciousness conferences with a philosopher named David Chalmers, and we've been doing it for uh, 20 years. And uh, so I dabble in philosophy, although I'm not trained in philosophy. So I'm mostly a medical doctor who does research in consciousness and anesthesia. Yeah, David Chalmers, by the way, has been one of my previous guests on my show. Um, very interesting guy. I used to read him when I was an undergrad in philosophy of mind. But let me ask you this then. Um, how is it that you got interested in an issue such as consciousness? What was it that got you so inspired that you've spent, what is it, 40 years diving uh, into the question? Uh, in undergraduate school at the University of Pittsburgh in the late 60s, I took a philosophy of mind class. I was a pre-med looking to go to medical school, but I took this class about how the brain produced consciousness and learned about Descartes, William James, Plato, and it got me interested in the problem. So in medical school, I was oriented towards uh, neurology, psychiatry, neurosurgery, but none of those lifestyles uh, really grabbed me. Uh, I did a research elective in medical school in, in a cancer lab studying how cells divide, for example. And in mitosis, when cells divide, these structures called microtubules and, and centrioles pull apart the chromosomes and the division has to be absolutely perfect. If, if it's not 50-50, a mirror image, then you get uh, cancer or abnormal development. Now, most of the people in the lab at that time got interested in the chromosomes and the genes. This was the beginning of the uh, genetic revolution, uh, genetic engineering. But I got interested in how these structures knew where to go and what to do. It seemed like there was some intelligence, maybe even consciousness at that level. And so I was interested in consciousness. And I said, what are these structures? And they turned out to be microtubules, which at that time in the early 1970s, had been shown uh, by crystallography to be lattice structures, to be polymers of individual proteins that could interact with each other. And they were also shown at that time to be plentiful in neurons. Neurons were full of microtubules. You could say neurons in the brain are almost made of microtubules. And I was learning about how computers work. And it, it seemed to me that the lattice structure of microtubules might be performing computation, that they might be some, some type of, of computer. And so uh, combined with the fact that anesthetics cause depolymerization de of microtubules and that, um, although at very high doses, uh, and that anesthesia was a good way to figure out consciousness, I went into the field of anesthesiology here at the University of Arizona and have studied consciousness, microtubules, and anesthesia ever since. Thank you, Stuart. That's sort of very illuminating. And we're going to come back to the microtubules, but let's take it as step by step here perhaps and let me let me ask you this first why is it important to figure out what consciousness is perhaps or how it works at least well to me it's important mostly because I'm curious about it um, it would also be good for uh, anesthesia so we can make sure patients aren't aware when they're supposed to be unconscious mm -hmm. maybe build better uh, anesthetics but also for treating the brain for treating psychiatric problems neurological problems uh, I think it's important to know how the brain works. And consciousness is the ultimate uh, product of the brain. And uh, consciousness is really the most important thing there is. Uh, it's the only thing that really matters. If you don't have consciousness, if you're brain dead, if, if you're not uh, conscious, uh, unless you're sleeping or under anesthesia, you've got nothing. You've got absolutely nothing. There's, there's, no, there's no existence. There's no purposeful meaning to life. So 
consciousness is the most important question there is. So for me, it's mostly a philosophical pursuit, but it also leads to uh, ways to treat the brain. If we understand how consciousness works, we can take care of uh, disorders of consciousness, awareness, neurological and psychiatric disorders. So let me grab one thought there where you just said that consciousness is the most important thing there is. But what is consciousness? How do you define it? I define consciousness as awareness, as, as having some phenomenal experience about either the external world or your internal world, or both. And awareness is another word, so that means you have to define that. But I think you know what awareness is. You're having a subjective experience, a first-person point of view. Now, it could have been that the world was populated by people like us without any inner consciousness, without any inner life. Uh, these would be called zombies, according to Dave Chalmers, the philosopher. Mm -hmm. And uh, since we can't measure or detect consciousness directly, for sure I can't say that you're not a zombie. You could be cleverly programmed to ask questions about consciousness without having any, and so could I. I could be uh, programmed to talk about conscious consciousness without having it. But I do have consciousness, I know that. Descartes said that's the only thing we can know. I think, therefore, I am. And so I know I have it, I presume that you have it. And the question is why? How does that come out of the brain? The brain is a piece of meat pinkish gray meat uh, made of 100 billion neurons which talk to each other by synapses. And most people say that the brain is a computer. Uh, neurons are like bits or neuronal firings are like bits. You get complicated enough computation and consciousness emerges as a novel property at some high level. The problem with that approach is that there's no specified threshold. You know, they don't say X number of neurons doing this sort of computation uh, or why that would happen. We have many uh, complex computers that aren't conscious. We have many things that are complex in the universe that aren't consciousness. So uh, computation and complexity per se are not the answer. So I'm going to come back to that thought again a little bit later, but I just want to lay the foundation for our audience who may not be as versed in neuroscience as you. Uh, so let me just ask you this. Um, I know you have an operation after this interview. So let's say you put uh, your patient asleep and after the operation is over, you wake them up. How do you know that they're not a zombie? How do you know that they're conscious? How do you know that you restored their original state they were in when they came into the operation room today? Well, before the operation, I can't say for sure they're conscious for the reasons I said before. So at the end, if their behavior is the same and they, they recognize themselves and us and their family and everything and are acting the same, I have to assume that they are. Um, I think there's an interesting phenomenon when patients are first waking up from anesthesia. They, they're awake, they're alert, they seem to be awake, they're looking around, they're breathing, they respond to command. They may not be conscious yet. There may be a phase where they're, they're having behavior, but they're not conscious. They could be temporarily in a zombie phase. I think, I think that may happen on emergence from consciousness, and other people in anesthesia think that too. Very interesting. So, so let me ask you this then, is, is understanding anesthesia the route to understanding what consciousness is perhaps? I think it's a very good route. I think uh, it may be one of the best, if not the best, uh, combined with other techniques. And uh, this study goes back about 150 years. Uh, Claude Bernard showed that uh, amoeba, a, a slime mold amoeba that crawl along, if you expose them to anesthesia, they stop moving. And he showed that happened in the cytoplasm, in the cell interior. Uh, later, at the turn of the 20th century, Meyer and Overton uh, in England and Germany uh, showed that the potency of a whole bunch of gases, which are anesthetic at different concentrations, uh, correlate over many orders of magnitude with their solubility in a lipid-like environment. It's something like olive oil or mm -hmm. benzene or phenyl rings. Mm -hmm. And because neuronal membranes are mostly lipid, people thought for many years that anesthetics acted lipid membranes, and that was the, that, that's what they did. They prevented membrane function that caused consciousness to stop. However, it turns out that anesthetics act on proteins. So then the assumption was membrane proteins, receptors for GABA-A, GABA -A, nicotinic acetylcholine, serotonin, glycine, et cetera. Um, but, the, but there's no real uh, uh, evidence that they do that in terms of um, different anesthetics having a different potency effects. For example, if we take, uh, uh, there's, there's three vaporizers over there, blue, uh, purple, and yellow. Uh, we'll show you that later, and they have different potencies. So uh, what you want to do is have a model system where, let's say, the, the, uh, the purple one is, is uh, twice as potent as, as another one. It should be twice as potent in, in blocking that effect. And we know that uh, the potency correlates with solubility. Uh, 
the latest work seems to show that anesthetics act actually inside the neuron on microtubules in the on the in dendrites and soma. Mm -hmm. Then let me ask you this: What is it that people have called the hard problem of consciousness? David Chalmers coined the term "the hard problem." Uh, it had actually been around uh, before. Thomas Nagel had a similar approach called "What is it like to be a bat? What is it like to be anything? What is it like to be human? What is it like to be Nick? What is it like to be Stuart? And what is it like to exist?" And it's a way of framing the question of experience of awareness as opposed to having non-conscious behavior. So the hard problem that, that Dave popularized is the question of experience, qualia. Qualia are uh, essential components of subjective experience. And uh, he distinguished the hard problem of qualia and conscious experience and phenomenal awareness from what he called the easy problems like m memory, behavior, uh, learning, self-reporting, which are not really easy problems. People spend their careers uh, on that. But compared to the philosophical enigma of conscious experience, they're relatively easy. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we already mentioned the brain is a computer. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the predominant opinion between neuroscientists, artificial intelligence researchers, and computer scientists is that the brain is basically a straightforward classical Newtonian computer. Do you agree with that? Absolutely not. Well, no, let, let me back up. It is for certain things, for non-conscious behavior. Uh, when you're doing, when your brain is doing things that, that may not require consciousness, uh, like, uh, you know, for example, you're driving to work, or I drive to work the same way, and uh, my mind starts to wander, and I'm thinking about my cases for the day. I'm not directly conscious of the road, for example. I may be on autopilot, and that could be classical computing, and I'm driving perfectly well. But when a horn honks or a light flashes or something happens, my consciousness goes back to paying attention or to being conscious of the road. So for things that don't require consciousness, uh, a classical computer uh, at the level of neurons and also in the microtubules might suffice. But for conscious awareness, I think you need something else, some extra ingredient which involves quantum mechanics, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where your uh, theory that you created together with uh, British physicist Roger Penrose comes in. So why don't you tell us, what is the ORCH or theory of consciousness? Did I pronounce that right? Orc or for orchestrated objective reduction. So um, let me just tell you the story. I, I spent uh, from the early 70s to the late 80s, early 90s, 20 years studying microtubule information processing, strictly classically. And uh, the microtubules are a lattice polymer, and they're made of peanut-shaped proteins called tubulins, which can have dipoles, which interact with the dipoles in the lattice around them, not unlike a computer matrix, in fact, very similar, uh, or something called a, a cellular automata or molecular automata. And so with physicist colleagues like Steen Rasmussen and uh, Steve Smith and others at Los Alamos, uh, we developed models of microtubules as classical computers, as classical molecular automata. And our point was this. Uh, Conventional AI singularity types uh, say that um, the brain is a computer with 100 billion neurons. Each neuron has 1,000 uh, synapses, let's say, switching at about 100 hertz. That gives you about 10 to the 15th or 10 to the 16th operations per second for the entire brain. So the singularity says when we have a computer that can do 10 to the 16th operations per second, we'll have brain equivalents. Uh, it'll be essentially identical to your brain. Uh, consciousness can happen in it. Uh, you can put your consciousness in it, and that's the singularity when brain when the computers uh, equal uh, brains. Now the problem is if you take it to the microtubule level, there's about 10 to the ninth tubulins, the, the subunits switching at about 10 megahertz. So that's 10 to the 16th operations per second per neuron times 10 to the 11th neuron, which gives you a capacity of about 10 to the 27th operations per second. So I was going around to AI and, and neural network meetings saying, you know, your goalpost is way, way downstream. Uh, you, you need to simulate a paramecium or a single neuron before you worry about uh, uh, a brain. A paramecium, like an amoeba, is a single cell organism. It has no synaptic connections, but it swims around, it finds food and mates, it has sex, it can learn. If you suck it into a capillary tube, it escapes faster each time, and yet it doesn't have any synaptic connections. It's just one cell. Mm -hmm. It uses its microtubules. Now, uh, assuming that a neuron is a bit like firing on or off is a tremendous insult to neurons. Neurons are much more complicated. So I was a, a, 
a pest and annoyance to AI, and still am actually, because I was saying that there was all this capacity that they needed to take into account uh, to explain the brain. But then one day somebody said to me, essentially put the hard problem in my face, although the hard problem hadn't been invented yet. He said, okay, let's say you're right. There's all this processing. The brain is 10 to the 27th per second, not 10 to the 16th. How would that explain consciousness? How would that explain awareness, phenomenal experience, love, joy, pain, uh, feelings? It's just more reductionist computation. And I was kind of startled and I realized that this person was right. And I took literally figuratively a long, hard look at myself in the mirror and said, I could be right about microtubules information processing capabilities, but that wouldn't explain consciousness. Fortunately, the same person suggested I read a book by uh, Sir Roger Penrose called The Emperor's New Mind, which was written in eight, 1989. I read it about 91. And uh, it was an amazing book. It, the Emperor's New Mind was kind of a slap in the face to AI. It challenged the idea that um, uh, consciousness and understanding was a computation through Gödel's theorem. Mm -hmm. uh, the emperor's new mind, meaning the emperor was naked, was uh, probably intended to at Marvin Minsky, since he was the scion of AI. Um, but it suggested a mechanism. It didn't just say that this theirs didn't work. It suggested an alternative or a supplemental mechanism having to do with quantum mechanics, quantum physics. He was saying that for conscious awareness and understanding, you needed a particular type of, of quantum state reduction, of collapse of the wave function, a type of quantum computer in the brain. But he didn't know what that computer was. He didn't have a candidate for a biological quantum computer in the brain, uh, but he just put the idea out there. So I read the book. I was kind of blown away by it. It was profound. I did, hadn't really uh, thought about quantum mechanics very much. A lot of it was, uh, was over my head, but intuitive, intuitively it felt right. And he said this collapse, this objective reduction that he called it, uh, uh, reduction, uh, state reduction of the wave function uh, by an objective threshold, which is why it's called objective reduction, um, was actually a process intrinsic to the fine scale structure of the universe, to Planck scale space-time geometry. Uh, he started with the question of superposition. So in quantum mechanics, there's all kinds of very weird and bizarre things, but they've been shown over and over again to be true. For example, a particle can be in two places at the same time, in quantum superposition. Um, but we don't see quantum superpositions in the world. We see things in definite places, definite uh, times. Um, and the act of observation seems to have something to do with that, which caused people to say consciousness collapses the wave function. But Roger started with the question, well, how can things actually be in two places or at the same time? And what he said was, he brought in Einstein's general relativity, where curvature is essentially equivalent to mass. So a particle over here would be a curvature sort of in this direction. A particle over here would be a curvature in this direction. So superposition would be curvatures in underlying space-time geometry in opposite directions, essentially a separation or bubble in the fabric of the universe. Now, if these separations continued, you'd have separate universes. And this, in fact, is the idea in the multiple worlds hypothesis, that every superposition leads to a whole new universe. But Roger said these separations were unstable, and after a time, T, depending on the magnitude of the superposition, would collapse to one or the other, and emit or be associated with the moment of conscious experience. So he had a mechanism for consciousness uh, based on quantum computation built into the fine scale structure of the universe, but he didn't, he didn't have a structure. So reading this and thinking about it for some time, I finally wrote to Roger Penrose and said, uh, I really liked your book. Uh, you have a mechanism, but you lack a, a good structure. I think microtubules might be the structure you're looking for. And I sent him some papers I'd written. I told him about a book I'd written about microtubules called Ultimate Computing. And I was delighted to have him write back to me and invite, him, uh, invite me to England. I was going there for a meeting and mentioned I was going to be in England. And so I visited him in Oxford at his office in the Mathematical Institute in uh, 1992. Uh, we talked for, he mentioned he was going to a conference at Cambridge with Dan Dennett, Pat Churchill, and other consciousness experts. And uh, I, I did most of the talking, he asked me a few questions, and I talked for several hours about microtubules. And he said, thank you very much, that was interesting. And so I left, and I th said, well, you know, that was cool. I met Roger Penrose, and <laughs> didn't expect anything to come of it. So I went to the meeting, I went to Europe, I came back two weeks later, was having dinner with a friend. He said, guess what, I went to this conference at Cambridge, Roger Penrose was talking about you and your microtubules. I said, no kidding, that was really cool. And the next thing that happened was I got invited to a meeting in Sweden that he was going to be at. I met him there along with Dan Dennett, Petra Storg, and some other people. 
And uh, I was planning the first Tucson conference, and I invited him, and we started developing our model, uh, which uh, has been going on for, for uh, 20 years now. And uh, basically, the idea is his mechanism of objective reduction in microtubules in the brain, orchestrated by synaptic inputs and vibrational tuning and things like that. So the model is called Orchestrated Objective Reduction, or OR. Now, if, if everybody get that very clearly, and <laughs> if it wasn't muddied enough, let me bring in even more confusion by asking you the following question. So Sigmund Freud says that about seven-eighths of, of us is subconscious mm -hmm. and about only one-eighth of the brain activity or, or of our mind is the conscious part. So is there any way you can fit the subconscious in your theory? Yes. And how? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I think let's divide the subconscious into uh, sort of autopilot stuff, things you do without, uh, you know, without the zombie stuff. With, yes, but don't involve uh, important stuff like Freud was referring to. But let's talk about Freud's uh, drives, id, you know, uh, dreams, all that stuff. I think that's uh, embedded in memory and manifests as quantum information. In fact, I think dreams are quantum information, and I, I've written a, a, a paper about that. You know, dreams, uh, time is all screwed up. Uh, uh, there's really no flow of time. You have multiple coexisting possibilities. The logic is backwards. There's all kinds of bizarre things in dreams which match very much quantum information. So I, th I think a subconscious in the Freudian sense is quantum information uh, that hasn't reached collapse. If it reaches collapse, you have a conscious moment. So there's all this stuff going on at the quantum level in the brain that may not, uh, may not reach consciousness, but is still actually influencing our actions in ways that we, we uh, don't appreciate or are very subtle. Mm -hmm. Can you perhaps, uh, for all the skeptics, perhaps you can give us some proven examples, if you can, from biology that exhibit some of the quantum effects that you mentioned? Yeah. So when we came out with our theory, uh, we were ridiculed, criticized, attacked, undermined, ambushed, even before <laughs> our first paper came out, by some very prominent people, which tells me that we're a threat to them, and, and they wanted to cut our legs off before we could go anywhere. Um, or maybe they just think you're very wrong. That too. Um, <laughs> but um, so, I'll, okay, I'll give them credit for that. Um, one of the, the main argument against us was that if you want to build a quantum computer in the laboratory, uh, you have to worry about thermal vibrations. Heat destroys quantum, uh, uh, certain types of quantum superpositions. So they build a quantum computer at absolute zero temperature. And so people said, well, if you, ha if you need absolute zero temperature for a quantum computer, how can it happen in the brain at 37 degrees, 37.6 degrees? How can it happen in biology at all? And we said, well, you know, A, biology has had uh, billions of years to evolve a mechanism. Number two, we think it's happening in these hydrophobic regions where anesthetics act inside proteins, which are isolated from the polar environment. So they're already isolated uh, from what would cause decoherence. Uh, so uh, for a number of years, it was a, a theory versus theory type argument. They would, Max Tegmark calculated uh, decoherence time that was way too fast. Uh, we published a response that. That, yeah. was, uh, that made it more reasonable, but it was theory versus theory. In about 2000, and the debate was for very specific frequencies that you're claiming that the vibration happens, and he was saying you're way off the mark in terms of the frequency. Well, that was the decoherence time. Uh, we hadn't gotten into frequencies yet, although you could relate it to frequencies. He calculated a, a decoherence time of 10 to the minus 13 seconds, and we needed about 10 to the minus 2 seconds. So, yeah. But he made several mistakes in his calculations. He actually disproved his own model, not ours. So when we corrected, we got it down to about 10 to the minus 4 seconds which is close to what we wanted. The important thing is, though, that people now have evidence for quantum biology. Beginning in about 2006, um, people started studying photosynthesis in, in plants. So we wouldn't be here if plants didn't make chemical energy for us to eat and for animals to eat. How do they do that? So in a, in a photosynthesis uh, protein complex, the light is absorbed uh, from the sun over here it needs to get transported over here to make chemical energy in food. It goes through a protein complex, and it has to be very efficient or the food wouldn't capture the, the energy of the sun. And this is all also relevant to solar cells and, and, and solar electricity. Um, they figured out that the energy was transferred from here to here by excitons or electronic excitations 
and through multiple pathways simultaneously, through what are called chromophores, aromatic groups, much like the aromatic amino acids inside microtubules and other proteins. And so the electronic energy was actually quantum coherent. It occupied all these pathways simultaneously, and the most efficient got there, and that's how we have the efficiency of, of photosynthesis. So if a potato or a tomato or a rutabaga can use quantum coherence, we figured, well, microtubules in the brain can do so. Still, it was more theory versus theory. And then uh, about in 2009, we began to hear reports from a man named uh, Anurban Banyapati, uh, working at the National Institute of Material Sciences in Scuba, Japan, which is, science's most, uh, which is Japan's most advanced uh, science city. That's actually what it's called, science city. And um, he was studying individual microtubules. He did some amazing experiments using nanotechnology, where he would take, for example, a single microtubule, which is 25 nanometers in diameter, and he would put four electrodes on it, two to stimulate and two to record. Now, under normal circumstances, without stimulating, the microtubule is a good insulator. There's no conductance, much less quantum conductance. However, when he stimulated with the other two electrodes, uh, alternating current at, and sweeping the frequency, going from very low to very high frequency, up to gigahertz, he, find, he found a number of specific resonance peaks where the microtubule became very conductive, superconductive, basically, if you uh, took away the, the interface uh, resistance. So at certain resonance peaks, microtubules become essentially, it looks like, superconductive and quantum devices. And so the mechanic, now he was putting an alternating current to electrical, but microtubules are also piezoelectric, so there could be some mechanical vibration. But at, that, at those specific resonant frequencies, the microtubules became quantum devices. And we think that these resonant frequencies are happening in the brain and that microtubules are quantum devices. So. Uh, that is very good evidence uh, for our theory that micro and he did it at room temperature, in air, uh, showing that it's quite feasible for quantum coherence to be happening in the brain, in microtubules, and that the heat, instead of destroying the, the quantum coherence, which is what the skeptics say, actually promotes the quantum coherence by pumping these, these modes, much like a laser. A laser is a quantum device which uses energy to drive uh, coherence of the crystal. Similarly, uh, Thermal energy in the brain could be driving the coherence in the microtubule, leading to the type of uh, quantum computation we need for Orc OR. Stuart, let me zoom out a little bit here and ask you this. Is it fair to say that currently the vast majority of physicists, as well as the vast majority of neuroscientists, for example, are, to say the least, highly critical of you? Or, or let's just say that they actually do not believe that, that in your theory, and, 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 and I don't think they accept the evidence. Is that fair to say? I would say they're disdainful, worse than skeptical. Uh, they don't want to even think about it, and they, they think we're wrong because everybody knows uh, you need to be at absolute zero to make a quantum computer. Now we have evidence that that's not the case. We also have evidence that anesthesia acts on microtubules. Now this evidence, Honor Bond's papers and the anesthesia studies, have come out in the last six months, in 2013. So I don't think they're aware of it yet, and I haven't had the opportunity to be talking about it, and it hasn't sunk in yet. Mm -hmm. We're going to, for example, though, we're going to have a debate at the American Society of Anesthesiologists meeting in October on whether anesthesia acts on membrane proteins, which is what almost everybody thinks, or cytoskeletal microtubules, which myself and a few people think. And I'm going to be debating uh, uh, Misha Peronsky, who's a uh, who's a uh, uh, researcher from University of Wisconsin, and I'm taking the microtubule approach. So mm -hmm. this, this, uh, this idea will be aired. And uh, also, um, perhaps even more significantly, Roger and I have just finished a review of ORC-OR after 20 years, and we've been working on it for a year. It includes the new evidence, uh, new arguments, uh, and I think we make a much stronger case. We're going to invite commentaries from a dozen or so uh, people, including our, our main critics, see what they say now in the face of evidence, and some prominent physicists, and we'll get it out there and let people talk about it. Um, I think, uh, you know, we've been dismissed out of hand because, uh, you know, everybody knows that you need absolute zero for quantum coherence, but yet it happens in photosynthesis and sunlight, so obviously that's wrong. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's fair to say we're kind of a speck on the horizon in terms of uh, theories of uh, uh, in physics and neuroscience, but we're getting uh, we're getting closer all the time, 
And I think within five years, we'll either be disproven or we'll be the, the dominant theory. I would have to say in, in, in modesty that ours is really the most comprehensive theory because it covers uh, neuroscience, physics, and philosophy, and quantum biology. There are theories in philosophy, there are theories in neuroscience, there are theories in physics about consciousness, but nothing puts it all together. They don't Ours puts the realms, it yeah. And we make testable predictions. In 1980, sorry, 1998, I published 20 testable predictions, and uh, a number of which have been validated. None of them have really been proven wrong. In our new paper, we review the status of those. Other theories of consciousness. Let don't me just stop you there for a second, if I may, because I, part of my preparation, I read a variety of resources, and however credible or uncredible you may find it, the Wikipedia article mentions those 20 uh, predictions that you make, testable predictions, and according to it, most of them have been disproven. That's definitely wrong. I saw that too. Um, and for example, uh, um, you know, the, the warm temperature business, they talk about the A lattice versus B lattice microtubules, they talk about gap junctions, they talk about some, some fairly minor things, all of which are wrong. And uh, we can go through them point by point, but they're in the new paper. So I, I dispute Wikipedia. And I, I, I accept that, of course. Let me give you another chance. You know, me and you met for the first time at the Global Future 2045 conference yeah. a couple of weeks ago in New York City. And two of the most prominent critics there were Ray Kurzweil and Randall Kuhn. So Ray Kurzweil from the stage, uh, his criticism went something like that. And let me see if I can quote as close from memory as I can. Quantum mechanics is this kind of very mysterious phenomenon, Ray said. The consciousness is also this very mysterious thing that we don't know much about. And he said that therefore you claimed that therefore the nature of consciousness must be quantum mechanical in character. What do you want to say about that? You know, Dave Chalmers called that, uh, jokingly, the uh, law of minimization of mysteries. If you have two mysteries, they might be the same mystery. Kind of joking. Um, they are related, though. It's clear that they're related in the observer effect. Now, how do you explain quantum superposition? I mean, is Ray saying that uh, quantum mechanics doesn't exist? Quantum mechanics is the most successful theory ever put forth. It predicts things out to, you know, 25 decimal points in, in calculations. We know that superposition, that quantum computing, that entanglement all exist. Yes, they're mysterious. Roger has some ideas about that. So just because it's a, a mystery doesn't mean it, it doesn't exist. It certainly exists. Now, we know from the days of uh, Niels Bohr and von Neumann and Wigner and Henry Stapp more recently, they think that consciousness causes collapse of the wave function. We turn it around. We say that the collapse is consciousness. But whether, whichever view you take, it's clear that consciousness and quantum mechanics are related. And they could be the same mystery. Why not? I mean, they could be related, certainly. They, they each have their, their other components or other aspects, but they're clearly related. The question is how. Let me ask you this then. Randall Kuhn's criticism was perhaps a little bit more specific, and his proposal was that you have to have, perhaps the best way to do it is to have a very specific test or experiment where something specific will happen that cannot be accounted for without quantum mechanics. And he says, unless you do that, you, uh, you cannot prove that the quantum mechanics is relevant at all. And he's obviously one of the skeptics here. Right. Well, first, I'll answer that in a second. First, let me say, what is the testable prediction coming out of AI and singularity? How are they going to prove their hypothesis? And I've been asking this question for 20 years. I haven't heard an answer. The other, well, the other Ray is giving examples such as the exponential growth of technology and a few benchmarks like Deep Blue defeating Kasparov in chess, perhaps That's Watson, not consciousness. Watson uh, defeating uh, Ken Jennings in Jeopardy. Not consciousness, but perhaps the steps, right? So we are short of consciousness. It's but that last step improving. that's the killer. Going from intelligence to consciousness. But isn't that showing we're getting closer? No, not to consciousness. We're getting more intelligent computers to be sure. Closer to consciousness? No, it doesn't say that at all. So there's no testable predictions coming from their side. Um, as, as far as Randall's question, I would have said, you know, five years ago, uh, microtubules must have quantum states. It's been proven. Honor Bond has shown that. I would have said anesthesia must act through microtubules. Now we've shown that. Anesthetics act through microtubules, even though that hasn't gotten out to the general public. Um, so how would we prove it definitively? I'm asking Honor Bond, <coughs> excuse me, and I think this is going to be done in the fall, 
to test anesthesia on his quantum states and microtubules. And uh, I think a group from Prague, uh, Mikhail Sifra from Picorni's group, is going to go and do these experiments. So what they're going to do is establish the quantum state in the microtubule at a certain resonance, bring anesthesia in, you know, put it in a chamber, bring, uh, it's in air, and then you add anesthetic gas, the quantum coherence should go away. You blow off the gas, it should come back. Then you use a second gas that's twice as potent, the same thing should happen at half the concentration. A third gas, and you, you plot the effect on uh, eliminating the quantum state in the microtubule with the known potency of the gas. If that works, I think that's pretty good evidence um, for it. And anyway, what we've done is far, far beyond any evidence coming from AI or singularity. They don't even address the issue of consciousness. They kind of treat it as trivial because they can't, they can't explain it and don't even want to deal with it. I think that's because the majority opinion right now is that consciousness is an emerging phenomenon as soon as you reach a certain level of complexity. That is, but what's the level of complexity and why isn't a, uh, a, a tropical storm uh, conscious? Or why isn't a computer conscious? Why isn't the internet conscious? Some people will say, well, yeah, it is, but then how do you prove that? So, and proving it is, is, is a separate issue. So this consciousness emerges from complexity, complex computation, is a hand-waving, fallback, desperate explanation. There's no evidence for it, and there's no real testable predictions. What's the level that it's going to emerge at? I still haven't heard an answer. So let me ask you this then. You mentioned a couple of uh, future tests that you plan to do in Prague, etc. Now, is that the best way to perhaps supply evidence or to prove in a way that your theory may be correct? Or do you have any other, do you have like a gold standard of any kind that you can say, if this were to be proven, I can honestly say I was right. Me and Roger were right. Well, you know, the ultimate gold standard is to reproduce consciousness or download consciousness. But the problem is, as you know, you can't prove consciousness. So we could have something that acts like it's conscious, but how would we know? The only way to do it would be to download your consciousness, come back and say, yeah, I was conscious when I was in that vat. That's a long way off. But that's the same problem that is faced by AI singularity types. Uh, so they tend to kind of ignore consciousness and, and get rid of it and, say, and, and use a, a bait and swap and wind up talking about intelligence like you just did talking about Watson and, and Big Blue. That's intelligence. That's information. That's not consciousness. So I go back to the, what I said before. If uh, anesthetics inhibit quantum states and microtubules proportional in relation to their potency and putting you or I to sleep, that's pretty good evidence. I'd mm -hmm. say that's 99% of the way. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps it might be fair to call me one of those AI singularity types. So let me ask Some you... Some of my best friends are AI singularity types. <laughs> Excellent, and I would be happy to be your friend. Uh, so let me ask you as a friend, the flip side of that coin, what would be the gold standard that would make you change your mind and say publicly perhaps, me and Roger, we were totally off base here, we were wrong. Uh, a demonstration of consciousness without microtubules or without quantum effects. Now that's a hard thing to do, and AI, which is why AI hasn't put forth any testable predictions, because they can't even imagine an experiment that would do that. So uh, it would be difficult. If, if uh, the anesthetics have no effect on the quantum states in microtubules, I would seriously rethink our position, mm -hmm. maybe even retract it, but it would depend on the experiment. Um, we know anesthetics bind in microtubules. We think we know exactly where they bind in these, uh, what we call them, quantum channels leading to quantum dipoles and helical pathways in the microtubules uh, that Travis Craddock and Jack Jasinski and I found uh, acting uh, uh, in the same uh, area that seems to give rise to the co quantum coherence that Honorbond has discovered. So the, the, the picture is falling together nicely, and I'm very optimistic about it. But again, if the anesthetics have no effect on the quantum states in microtubules, that would be a big setback. Stuart, let's assume for the sake of the argument you're absolutely wrong, uh, absolutely right. I mean, absolutely correct in your theory. What's the bottom line, most important implications that you can think of? Understanding consciousness would help us a lot in treating mental disease, uh, neurological disorders. I'll give you one example. Um, um, one of the resonant frequencies that Honorbond found is in megahertz, actually a whole bunch of resonant frequencies. Megahertz is ultrasound, which we use in medicine all the time. So I, I, I said, uh, and, and ultrasound has been shown to have effects in the brain, in animals, uh, electrophysiology, and behavior. 
So uh, we, I said, well, maybe ultrasound of the brain would affect consciousness in some way. So uh, we tried it and we did a study and ultrasound for 15 seconds at eight megahertz to the brain uh, causes an improvement in mood. You actually get a little bit happier 10 and 40 minutes after the exposure. We published that in Brain Stimulation. It just came out a couple months ago. We're doing a follow-up study uh, at two megahertz for 30 seconds. It seems to be getting better results. We're also doing studies in, in a lab here at the University of Arizona uh, with uh, Uma Raman and Surav Ghosh, who are looking at ultrasound effects on individual neurons as they start to grow axons and dendrites. And the preliminary evidence, and, and this is very early, seems to show that the ultrasound is promoting the early development, uh, promoting development of, of neurons by, we think, vibrating the microtubules and making them more active. If that's true, then we, can, we intend to try it on brain damaged patients. Uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, soldiers coming back, people who've been in car accidents, uh, because it should help make new synapses, promote uh, neuron growth, and reestablish connections. The same problem is in Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's disease is a disease of, of microtubules. Despite the uh, amyloid plaques, it's actually the neurofibrillary tangles inside the, the neurons that cause the problems. So maybe ultrasound will help in Alzheimer's. So there are many, many medical, uh, medical applications whether it's quantum or not, just addressing the microtubules. Now, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in, uh, in the larger sense, in the philosophical sense, if the Orkowar proposal is correct, it means that consciousness is really happening at the level of space-time geometry, at the Planck scale, the lowest level of the universe, between the ears and the microtubules in the brain. Now, about 12 years ago, there, was, uh, there were two studies in Europe on patients who had uh, cardiac arrests and had uh, uh, so-called near-death and out-of-body experiences. They saw a white light, a tunnel. In some cases, they floated out of their body. And they asked, uh, they asked the people who did the study, well, how do you explain that? And they said, uh, we don't know. Ask Penrose and Hamroff because they have this crazy theory. So Roger didn't want to get involved. And I said, well, maybe. And I've seen this happen. Okay, it happens. I, I said, well, under normal circumstances, it's happening in space-time geometry in the brain, uh, but when the coherence is lost, the, 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 the blood stops flowing, the energy is lost, the quantum information isn't destroyed, but sort of dissipates or leaks out to the universe at large, but remains entangled as a kind of quantum soul, if you will. The patient is revived and it goes back in. The patient said, hey, I was floating above my, my body. Or if the patient dies, maybe it persists indefinitely in, in the universe at large, maybe even goes back into a new uh, organism or creature in, in, in reincarnation. It makes these things possible. It makes afterlife a plausible scientific possibility. Right now, scientists say, no, that's impossible. But those scientists can't explain consciousness in the brain. They can't say that consciousness out of the brain is impossible. So I think it would have implications for the possibility, the plausibility for afterlife and out-of-body experiences. It also can explain parapsychology and all kinds of weird phenomena that seem to happen that scientists won't, e won't even consider because they don't make any sense in their context, in the context of the brain as a, a classical computer. Brain as a quantum computer opens the door, a Pandora's box, to all kinds of weird things that might be true after all. It does. So would that mean that we actually have a soul? I mean, I, I am one of those singularity AI types who, who, who are atheists largely right. and who don't believe in the soul. So what you're telling me now is that I may actually have some kind of a quantum soul? Yes. Maybe when your body dies, you'll uh, be in an afterlife, even if you are an atheist. So Stuart, does that mean you're actually a dualist? I'm not a dualist. Uh, I think um, because the, the soul would be in Pl Planck scale space-time geometry, not outside science. A dualist is somebody who thinks that, that uh, consciousness is outside of science is outside the universe even, people say, outside of space and time, below the Planck scale. No, consciousness is in the Planck scale in the universe, just outside of the classical world, outside of the material world. So it's physical in terms of physics, including quantum and Planck scale geometry and fundamental space-time geometry, um, but it's not material because the quantum level is pre-material. Material hasn't happened yet. When the collapse occurs, that's material. So when material uh, e emerges from quantum, it's at that point, that particular point, that consciousness happens. And, quant and consciousness or, or su subconscious, even quantum information, uh, can exist uh, in potentially uh, in, uh, in space-time geometry 
at large in the universe. I don't think we can rule it out. I'm not a big proponent of it. I don't go trying to prove it or teaching it. I just think you can't say no until we know what consciousness actually is. That's actually a lot of stuff coming at me right now, and I think I may need a few seconds to process it. So in the meantime, let me ask you a couple of specific occasions. So my mother-in-law uh, uh, passed out a couple of months ago, and she described uh, those sort of white light kind of experiences. The interesting thing is that, you know, I kind of underplayed it very seriously because uh, last summer um, I fell down the stairs uh, going out with my bike and I went out con uh, unconscious and I don't remember a thing. I just remember trying to get up and then the next thing I know is I'm waking up and I was already on the floor and I was thinking, hey, wait a minute, last time I remember I was already halfway up and now I'm on the floor. That's kind of weird. And then I was like, oh, I must have been out for some time. But I don't remember any light, any out-of-body experience. So how would you explain that? So the difference between those two is that you lost consciousness for whatever reason, maybe from a concussion. I did have a serious concussion. And by the way, concussions have been now shown to be correlated with broken microtubules. There's very good evidence for that. So we're going to also try ultrasound for concussion, see if we can get those microtubules back together. Your mother-in-law... Let's, I don't know, but let's say she had a cardiac arrest, her heart stopped. So there was no blood flowing to her brain temporarily. The microtubules lost their drive. It's like turning off a, drive, a light to a laser, the light goes out. But the quantum information uh, in her brain uh, wasn't destroyed, but let's assume she had an out-of-body experience, uh, leaked out to the universe at large and remained entangled and then went back inside. Now, a lot of critics say, oh, these near, it's, it's hypoxia. It's the lack of oxygen. I've seen a lot of hypoxic patients, and they don't have calm, serene uh, affect. They are panicked and agitated and confused. Uh, patients who are having a near-death experience report being clear, calm, peaceful with the white light. It's a completely different experience. So let me ask you this then, kind of more philosophical. How is this theory of the quantum soul, or however it's the more appropriate way to call it, similar or different to Eastern philosophy, to traditional Eastern philosophy, because what you're telling me is kind of very similar, or perhaps repeating the same thing that the Eastern, say, Zen Buddhism or even Hinduism have been saying for thousands of years. I think it's quite similar, actually. They're talking about prana, chi, chi. Yeah. yeah. I would say chi and prana are uh, quantum vibrations uh, emanating from microtubules throughout the body. The acupuncture meridians, are, there's microtubules in the nerves where they are. And I think this, uh, this type of chi energy is, uh, is quantum coherence in microtubules. And I think uh, it also means that consciousness is, the Eastern approach is say consciousness is everywhere in the universe. I would agree with that, except maybe call it proto-conscious, uh, which, which means that it's not conscious as we know it until it gets uh, assembled and orchestrated. So it's OR without orchestration. And our brains and microtubules put all the ORs together into this complex picture that we have now in our brains, in our conscious awareness. Uh, and in the Hindu, at least, as I said, it's, it's plausible that there could even be reincarnation. So I think it's very consistent with Eastern philosophy. Can you perhaps tell us a little bit more about, say, Zen Buddhist monk meditation and how that could be an example or not yeah. of, of what you're talking about? Yeah, so let me back up and say that in Orc OR, uh, consciousness is a sequence of discrete events. I think even without Orc OR, in neuroscience in general, you know, the first question is what is consciousness in terms of its description and is it a continuum, is it a property? I would say it's a sequence of discrete events. And if you go in, in the Buddhist uh, literature going back, you know, thousands of years, somehow they were able, in deep meditative states, they, were, uh, they reported a flickering in their awareness. And somehow they're able to count these flickerings, and it turned out to be somewhere between uh, uh, around 50 per second, 50 hertz. This comes from several lines of Buddhist uh, literature. And that's gamma synchrony EEG. And uh, now in the modern neuroscience, gamma synchrony EEG, 30 to 90 hertz, is the best marker of consciousness, usually around 40 hertz. So in anesthesia, your 40 hertz goes away, and you get slow, slower EEG, but the 40 hertz is gone. 40 hertz which is really anywhere between 30 and 90, seems to be uh, the best marker of consciousness. Now, uh, in, the, in the monks, uh, a number of years ago, the uh, Dalai Lama sent his, his best meditators, meditating monks to Richard Davidson's lab, University of Wisconsin, 
and they, they had them meditate uh, with EEG, and they found that while you or I might be 40, the monks went to 80 or 90. And the, the, uh, the um, waves were the highest amplitude and highest uh, coherence and highest frequency ever recorded. So uh, I think it's when you are excited, enlightened, uh, uh, in an altered state, you go from, say, 40 to 80 to 100, maybe even to 1,000. Uh, uh, beats uh, conscious moments per second. This is, uh, this is uh, consistent with the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, who said that consciousness is a sequence of occasions of experience occurring in a wider field of, uh, of proto-conscious experience. And Abner Shimony uh, likened those uh, occasions to quantum state reductions. So this has a grounding not only in Eastern philosophy, but also uh, Western philosophy. And one final point on that is that in our latest uh, uh, paper, that hasn't quite come out yet. Uh, Roger and I come up, actually it was Roger's idea, uh, that uh, if you take uh, th that the gamma synchrony, the 40 hertz conscious moments that we uh, recognize are actually beat frequencies of, of higher frequencies. So you know in music you have beats. If you have two similar frequencies that are off by a certain amount, you get beats that are the difference between those frequencies. So let's say we take honor bonds, uh, megahertz, 10 megahertz, uh, uh, oscillations in microtubules. So we have one set of microtubules at, at exactly 10 megahertz and then another at 10.0001 megahertz. The difference is going to be in the gamma range. And so gamma synchrony may be B frequencies of even higher, which makes consciousness actually very musical, I think. It's almost because you have resonances and you have beats over different scales. And this could even ex extend into uh, higher frequencies within the fine scale structure of the universe. So it's really the music of the universe going down to the Planck scale. Consciousness is the quantum music of the soul. That's like really taking me into new, new territory That's here. what you said. I said consciousness is the music of the universe, but close enough. Fair, fair enough, fair enough. So let me ask you this. We're still assuming that your theory is correct here. What's the implications for the AI singularity types like me uh, with respect in particular to mind uploading or whole brain emulation as Randall Kuna calls it or creating of artificial intelligence as Ray Kurzweil together with Google or many others are working on? Well, artificial intelligence is one thing, but if you're talking about artificial consciousness, if you're talking about uploading or downloading your mind or having a conscious computer, it's not going to happen this way. Uh, neurons are, are, are way more complicated than simple bit states. But even if they went to the 10 to the 26 operations per second, that wouldn't give you consciousness in my view. You need this, this, quantum, uh, this quantum approach. You need ORCOR. Now, the good news is, in, as I said in my talk at GF 2045, that microtubules can be assembled fairly easily. If you get enough tubulin, they will self-assemble into an array as, as large as you want. Or you could use some other material that would do the same thing. Uh, fullerenes or graphenes, for example, that can have quantum properties. So I think the, the only way that this might happen, and it's still a long shot, would be uh, some kind of uh, 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 downloading in, by quantum teleportation into a medium that can do this quantum computation. It might be as simple as using photon echo of the retina, because if consciousness is holographic in the brain, you can get quantum signals out of the retina, which could reflect the entire consciousness in the brain, quantum teleport that to a vat of fullerenes or something, that might do it. I think that's a long shot, but that's the best way. I don't think it's going to happen by one neuron, one bit. That's just naive. So, so what you're saying is that basically it may be much, much harder perhaps to do mind uploading, but it's not theoretically unfeasible to do it, provided you get quantum teleportation. Provided you get ORC OR in whatever medium. And uh, it may actually be easier because um, if you can do this uh, trick with the photon echo or interface with the mind, uh, with, with consciousness in some way using uh, some tricky quantum optical approaches, which a guy by the name of Pierre St. Hilaire has been suggesting for a number of years, you might be able to get the, and then upload into uh, some alternative medium. I mean, we're proposing a mechanism, orc -OR, that gives you consciousness. It doesn't have to be in microtubules. It could be in some other... Uh, appropriate uh, medium. It's just that microtubules have evolved specifically to do this and are pretty, pretty good at it. I think, you know, maybe perfect. Uh, Stuart, I recently read an op-ed article in the New York Times where David Brooks uh, wrote the following. The brain is not the mind. 
it is probably impossible to look at a map of brain activity and predict or even understand the emotions, reactions, hopes and desires of the mind. So next time somebody looks at an fMRI and tells you they can see the brain, be skeptical. What do you want to say about that? Bravo, hooray, I'm glad he said it. He's exactly right. Uh, MRI is, uh, you know, they're mistaking the map for the territory. Uh, they're mistaking uh, uh, metabolic activity for consciousness. And MRI in particular has problems. Let me give you an example. There was a study in uh, England uh, last year from David Nutt's laboratory uh, who has studied psychedelics for years. And he's arguing that to understand consciousness and the brain, we need to use these drugs that, that give hallucinogenic experience, LSD and whatnot. So they did a study where they gave volunteers uh, the active ingredient in hallucinogenic mushrooms, psilocybin. And they actually gave it intravenous, so it would act right away in a standardized dose, while they were in an MRI scanner, and also EEG and MEG. And uh, I, what do you think the MRI showed under those circumstances? I would imagine it's all bright, all like... Lit up like a pinball machine, ding, 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 all this kind of stuff? Yeah. Exactly the opposite. Cold, dark, and silent. They looked like they were unconscious or or even brain dead. There was absolutely no, well, MRI has baseline activity, but it, compared to baseline, it was lower. And yet, we know from, the, from their reports later that they were having these extremely vivid uh, hallucinations and, uh, and experience. So how do you, and also their EEG, MEG was, was pretty much flat. There was no activity. So my interpretation is that under those circumstances, consciousness went to a deeper level kind of in a, in a scale-free hierarchy down into the microtubules, strictly quantum. Quantum doesn't need a lot of energy. It's very, very low energy. What needs energy and what generates MRI activity, membrane activity, the ATPase uh, and everything that, that requires uh, ion channel gradients, that requires energy and that generates EEG. So if your consciousness goes to a deeper level, more intense, maybe even also the monks go to a deeper level, you're more conscious, but your, uh, your membranes are silent. Now, what they lose under those circumstances is cognition. They lose the ability, for example, you wouldn't want them driving you home. They may not be able to drive very well, but internally they're having very, very vivid, intense experience. So consciousness and experience is not, this, is not really reflected in, the, in MRI at all. We've been talking for a while, and unfortunately we're getting towards the end of our interview. So let me ask you the last two or three questions here. Tomorrow we're visiting the Alcor Foundation and we're interviewing the CEO, Max Moore. Um, and there's a, a couple of alternative technologies um, to cryonics, uh, such as, for example, chemical brain preservation. Let me ask you, what's your take on either of those, or both, chemical brain preservation, uh, cryonics? If they're not preserving the microtubules, it's a big waste of time and money. And, uh, you know, if they're just preserving the, the neuronal mappings or the neurons, if, these people, if and when they wake them up, they're going to be zombies or, or the, if, if they wake up at all. I would say they, they probably w wouldn't wake up. Now, I know there's some studies where uh, they wake up rats and they have some memory and, and maybe they can, but you have to be, for consciousness, you, you have to preserve the microtubules, the fine scale structure, and I don't think they're doing that. Uh, John Hayworth at the, at the GF 24, 2045 conference who was doing brain preservation, probably the top guy. Ken do, Hayworth. Ken Hayworth, thank yeah, you. I've interviewed him on yes. the show before. He told me, we were talking about, uh, uh, and he's doing electron microscopy. Yes. Uh, he told me, and I mentioned that the preservative, uh, the fixative agent, osmium tetroxide, which was used prior to 1972, was dissolving all the microtubules. And they switched to glutaraldehyde, and all of a sudden they see all this, this microtubule activity. He said, yes, that's true. And if you use, uh, but if you use glutaraldehyde, you miss the membranes. If you use osmium tetroxide, you, use, you miss the microtubules. So they have to figure out a way to get both. And they have mm -hmm. to figure out, figure out a way to preserve the information in the microtubules. Otherwise, I don't think it's going to work. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of uh, alternative projects like Dr. Henry Makram's project, uh, the Human Brain Project in Europe, which, by the way, recently got a billion dollars worth of funding for the yeah. next 10 years, 100 million per year. Uh, what do you think of that? Well, first of all, Henry Markram is coming to our consciousness conference uh, we're having a 20-year anniversary conference. We invited some of the leading people in the world. And I respect his work. But I don't think that's going to capture consciousness. I think they'll learn a lot about the brain. But in terms of, understand, uh, in terms of reproducing consciousness, I, I doubt it. 
Stuart, what's the best place for people to find more about you and your work? My website, www.quantumconsciousness.org. Uh, come to our uh, uh, Tour to Science of Consciousness conferences, the 20-year anniversary conference, April 21st to 26th at, uh, here in Tucson, Arizona, sponsored by the Center for Consciousness Studies, www.consciousness.arizona.edu. And uh, by all means, read the uh, paper when it comes out in the fall from uh, myself and Roger Penrose, uh, Consciousness in the Universe, Review of the orco -R Theory. Mm -hmm. Stuart, we've been talking here for over an hour, perhaps. If people were to take a single message, perhaps the most important thing for our conversation, what would you like that to be? Consciousness is more than computation. Consciousness is something deeper, more profound, connected to the quantum structure of the universe. It's, uh, it bridges between uh, uh, science and spirituality. And I think actually will blur that distinction uh, if it turns out to be true, which I think it will. Consciousness is more than computation. Yes. I really like that. Dr. Kamarov, thank you very okay, much. Nick, thank you.